first ran into him when I helped to get him arrested back in about 1971 or 72. You did a good uh, job. At, at uh, Congress where we were petitioning the government on redress of grievance for the bombing of the dikes and the dams in North Vietnam at the height of the Vietnam War. And at that point, Richard took a stand for international law, for human rights, uh, and for the ability to speak up for a very unpopular issue at that time, um, but to speak with integrity and even to be willing to spend an evening in the D.C. lockup uh, as a result of that. And in the many decades since then, uh, he has continued uh, in, his uh, in his journey of speaking truth to power, of speaking up on unpopular issues, being uncompromising in his willingness to speak truth in difficult situations. I'm Helena Cobbin. I'm the founder and CEO of Just World Books, and we are really thrilled that Richard agreed to publish two titles with us, the first of which is uh, available, you can see Palestine, The Legitimacy of Hope. Um, the second one will come up, will come up, will come out. Um, I think early in, well, sometime in the spring of next year, and that'll cover the rest of the Middle East, not Palestine. And if you caught him on Democracy Now! this morning, you would have heard that he did two long segments, one on Palestine and one on Turkey, Syria, the Islamic State, and that whole complex of issues, which is another of his many areas of expertise. Mm -hmm. You came to listen to uh, my fine author, Richard Falk. Uh, it's a moving experience for me to be here, uh, not so much to be surrounded by my book, but uh, uh, to uh, be in the presence of really uh, dear friends from the Vietnam past, as uh, Doug mentioned, Cora and Peter Weiss, who uh, were comrades in that period and ever since. Uh, it, for me, Vietnam was the stepping stone to Palestine. And uh, my own political education uh, arose as a consequence of an engagement with uh, the forces opposed to the Vietnam War, uh, starting with a uh, very conventional realist opposition to the war of the sort that people like George Kennan and later George Ball, members of the American establishment, had of questioning the real, the, uh, whether it was a prudential use of American power. And it was only when I went to Vietnam uh, initially in 1968 and then in 72 with Cora and a couple of other people uh, that I saw the war from the perspective of those being victimized. And that transformation of the experience of a detached analyst versus somebody that identifies with the people who are enduring a one-sided war where they're, uh, where they're essentially victims of a uh, violent process that resembles torture because the, uh, the U.S. military dominance was so complete that it just reduced itself to choosing how to inflict pain mm -hmm. with no capacity for retaliation on the part of those being victimized. And that's the structure of torture. Structure of torture is the torturer decides how to inflict pain, and the target of the torture is a, is a coercively passive victim of that process. The Palestinian uh, national movement has proceeded through four uh, main phases. Uh, it started 
uh, it started by way of the neighbors of Israel, the Arab neighboring countries of Israel, uh, attempting to uh, end the uh, the idea of a, of a uh, Zionist state in the midst of the Middle East, and a series of wars, uh, 48, 56, uh, 67, and 73, were all lost by these Arab neighbors. So the first phase of the Arab Nash, of the Palestinian movement, was a failed effort to liberate Palestine from without, from the from the regional actors, and when this failed, the, the uh, second essential phase, which I think one could uh, roughly date around 1967, involved a period where the idea of national liberation was premised on armed struggle, that the Palestinians would find a way to make the uh, occupation of uh, West Bank and Gaza and uh, East Jerusalem uh, so costly and so unsatisfactory that Israel would allow a uh, viable Palestinian state to uh, emerge or would agree to some kind of binational state. Uh, and again, this period, which is, it, is the origins of how the Palestinians became perceived as uh, terrorists in the role of exercising resistance. And they did commit acts of terror. At the same time, they were uh, certainly entitled by international law and by the uh, whole ethos of the anti-colonial movement to exercise uh, a right of resistance in pursuit of their uh, national goals. But in any event, this uh, reliance on armed struggle also failed. And it was succeeded by the, what I call roughly the Oslo approach, which was a shift to uh, trying to find, trying to real, trying to uh, achieve uh, Palestinian self-determination by way of intergovernmental diplomacy, traditional uh, kind of diplomacy, but it was a very uh, flawed framework uh, where uh, the United States was the exclusive intermediary despite being the unconditional uh, partisan of the stronger side in the uh, negotiations. And what was uh, particularly uh, unacceptable about this framework was that it excluded the one domain where the Palestinians had an advantage, namely international law. Every issue of importance that's in contention from an international law perspective is clearly uh, favorable to the Palestinians. Whether one talks about refugees or borders, withdrawal, Jerusalem, water, uh, all settlements, as well as the day-to-day -day, uh, violation of human rights associated with the way in which uh, the occupation is maintained most uh, dramatically, I suppose, in the uh, maintenance of a regime of collective punishment in Gaza, uh, which is uh, highlighted in recent years, ever since Hamas won the elections in 2006, by these military onslaughts that one can't talk really about as wars because they're so one-sided that people struggle to find a language appropriate to the 
uh, devastation. And, and in that sense, it's a, a extreme example of what I initially experienced in North Vietnam during the Vietnam War, because it is so one-sided, and the Palestinian civilian population is utterly vulnerable and without even having the default uh, option of becoming refugees or uh, internally displaced persons. As horrible as the situation has been in Syria and Iraq, the civilian population at least could flee from the combat zone. In uh, Gaza, they're locked into the combat zone. And it's, it will be a kind of astounding reality if the entire uh, population of children and adolescents haven't been traumatized in a uh, permanent way by experiencing these, uh, this form of uh, intense combat. And just to be in, I was in Gaza at the end of 2012, right after the second of these uh, three uh, major military operations. And just the, the, the claustrophobic sense of the place, which is so crowded and so poor, even if there was no Israel on the planet, would itself be a challenge to maintaining a normal sense of psychological equilibrium. But when you couple that with the uh, intense process of intimidation involving uh, uh, drone overflights that are going on all the time, and uh, uh, sonic booms that uh, punctuate the silence of the night, it, it's, it's a, uh, a place that is hard to imagine if you haven't been there. Uh, and it's an international scandal that silence has been the, res essentially silence has been the response uh, to these Israeli uh, forms of collective punishment. So uh, this is a long way of saying that this third dip uh, diplomatic uh, path to peace and self-determination also was, uh, is a failure and is at last being acknowledged as a failure even by governments and even by governments in uh, Western Europe. And so the Swedish pledge to recognize Palestinian statehood and the uh, House of Commons vote to uh, urge the British government to recognize Palestinian statehood are not so important uh, for the issue they address, but what they are basically saying, we're not going to leave the f diplomatic future of this conflict in the hands of Washington any longer. It's really a challenge to Washington, not to Israel. Uh, it's only indirectly to Israel. Uh, and and it, it is a uh, sense that this way of managing uh, conflict resolution is unacceptable from the perspective of democracy and human rights. And so the fourth, and in my view, the foundation of Palestinian hopes for the future lie with what can uh, loosely be called the agency of people, not the uh, agency of governments, not the agency of military power, but the civil society uh, capacity to mobilize moral outrage in politically relevant ways. And in that sense, I think the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign, uh, modeled to a degree after the South African campaign, is a 
a sign of uh, an awakened political imagination on the part of Palestinian civil society really goes back to 2005 when the Palestinian uh, civil society actors, about 170 of them, issued this appeal for the BDS campaign. And it, but it's only in recent years that it's gained momentum. And one of the interesting things is that I think that this civil society movement, uh, which has uh, other dimensions to it, uh, is really the uh, provides the nexus of Palestinian leadership to a much greater degree than the people in Ramallah do. In other words, those who lead these civil society initiatives are much more representative of the uh, aspirations of the Palestinian people. And one of the deficiencies of the way world order is structured in the world is this presumed representational authority of governmental structures. And this, in this sense, the Palestinian Authority is caught, uh, it's, it's not an easy position that they have. They're uh, squeezed between the pressures exerted by the United States and uh, Israel and the pressures from their own people. And so they uh, try to walk this tightrope of uh, uh, su surviving as a political entity, but surviving in a way that doesn't uh, antagonize Tel Aviv or Washington to any considerable degree. And as you probably know, they, were, they suppress uh, Palestinian expressions of solidarity, for instance, with the recent, uh, with, the, with the people of Gaza during the recent uh, military operation. So they, in a sense, perform, they perform security functions on behalf of Israel. And that was one of the deficiencies of Oslo uh, also, that in effect it delegated to the Palestinians the suppression of their own liberation movement. And that's not an ideal situation, to put it uh, mildly. And so, uh, let me conclude by saying that the book tries to dwell on the virtues of this fourth phase. And to me, that's the premise of hope for the Palestinian struggle the first three phases being effectively discredited uh, by uh, historic failures. And the fourth phase, which seems from a, uh, uh, the perspective of common sense or uh, prevail conventional wisdom, to be uh, very difficult to imagine uh, achieving victory until you look at the historical record of how political conflicts have been resolved in the last 75 years. And if you do, if you look carefully at that record, you will see the surprising result that very rarely has the side with military superiority prevailed in the end. I've often uh, quoted a conversation between uh, a Vietnamese colonel and a, an American counterinsurgency specialist uh, after the Vietnam War was over, and the American said to the Vietnamese, you know you never defeated us on the battlefield. And the Vietnamese response was, that's true, but it's irrelevant. See, and understanding that irrelevance is the unlearned lesson of the uh, 
way in which Washington continues to try to reinvent counterinsurgency warfare. And Israel and the United States are both in that uh, uh, earlier colonialist view, which, what, which was accurate during the colonial era, where military superiority did indeed trump political resistance and uh, did it at an efficient cost. But that hasn't been true. Uh, for the last 75 years. And, and uh, uh, in some ways, the paradigmatic example is uh, Gandhi's uh, nonviolent triumph over the British Empire. And Gandhi's uh, familiar uh, phrasing of uh, the, the narrative of uh, Indian uh, liberation. Uh, first, they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. <laughs> uh, and uh, in, I, I feel that uh, you never know what will happen in the future, but the flow of history certainly is uh, consistent with a Palestinian uh, victory. Uh, whether that victory, what that victory translates into is up to these two peoples to determine. And a sustainable and just peace involves finding a path to self-determination that encompasses both peoples. Is not, a second dispossession of uh, the Jews from Israel is not a uh, solution at this stage, however uh, unjust and unlawful was the path taken to establish uh, the State of Israel. And I've said uh, recently that if Zionism is to survive as an acceptable political project, it has to give up the idea of being a state and reconcile itself to being uh, the foundation of a Jewish homeland, which was the original promise, actually, in the Balfour Declaration. And this shift from being a homeland to being a state is part of what has uh, given uh, energy to this uh, uh, Zion maximalist Zionist idea of recovering the whole of historic Palestine as the foundation of a Jewish state, oblivious to the fact that you can, in the 21st century, uh, respect you, the human rights of people that are living within that state and yet claim an ethnic uh, particularity that favors only one uh, people, one dominant people. Human rights is founded, fa the foundation of human rights is, the, is human dignity and not the dignity of Jews or Christians or any particular subspecies identity. It's a species identity that is the foundation of human rights. And so, my book, as I say, tries to argue along these lines, and thanks to the editors, the narrative is less incoherent than it would have been if left in my hands. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Mother Agapia, and I'm an Orthodox Christian nun, and I lived for 10 years in Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives and worked at a, a school for girls in Azaria. And I'm, I thank you very much, because at least you're uh, an articulate spokesperson and someone who tries to speak the truth about what's going on there. But I'm a little frustrated. You provide a vision for what's the next step, you know, sort of using the soft power. But how can that really be done on the ground, both in Palestine? I said I, I worked at a school, and what do I say to the girls who are now 25 years old? It seems like there's a passivity there. 
either you follow the way of militancy or you know that the government in Ramallah wasn't effective and that's not a way to go. But it seems there's no leadership on the ground to provide a vision for young people how to take that step to, to show that they are Palestinians and they want to live in their country in peace. And at the same, sorry, it's a long question. The second one is for the people here in the West, what more, I know that the political avenue is totally closed. I'm well aware of the lobby and how things work in Congress, but what is that, the soft power things we can do here to sort of, I'm intrigued about what happened in, in the UK and how did they sort of get that drip drip process that got the uh, people to change their minds where you had conservative politicians now saying, I'm ashamed of what's happening in Israel. Uh, yeah, well, those are uh, very uh, important issues that you uh, raise, and I don't have uh, the kind of uh, satisfying answers that uh, could uh, address them altogether, uh, because one is in a, uh, all, until this kind of soft power politics reaches the point of success, it seems like it's hopeless as an undertaking. And that was true. I was in South Africa not long before Nelson Mandela was released, and no one there, whatever their political persuasion, thought that there could be any future for South Africa other than by way of a sustained uh, civil war that took place there. And w so that what I think is happening is a gradual uh, buildup of pressure that's changing the political climate, and at some point it will lead to, one hopes, a recalculation of interests on the Israeli side. And they could change the situation overnight by for instance, releasing Barghouti from prison. He's not Mandela, but he's, he's capable of providing a unifying political symbol, and it would signal a seriousness of intention to find a solution. At the present, Israel feels no pressure to find a solution, and the U.S. Uh, geopolitical muscle uh, reinforces that absence of pressure. And the pressure is so absent that uh, Israel doesn't even uh, mind uh, insulting the American president or, uh, you know, they're so self-confident at this stage uh, in, in that way. But what I would say, I, I think that there's a, um, a, a, a rather nice phrasing that uh, Abraham, Abraham Heschel, the Jewish philosopher, gave, which is, uh, f few are guilty, but all are responsible. Mm -hmm. And I think there are real possibilities in each of our life situations uh, for taking that responsibility, but there's no template, there's no general formula uh, that will uh, tell, uh, give us a, uh, an idea of what should be done. I mean, it, there are many uh, what I call legitimacy uh, battlefields, so to speak, uh, that, that are, exist here in the United States, the divestment uh, campaigns in university campuses have uh, accelerated in the last uh, two, three years in ways that are rather dramatic. And the discourse has changed quite dramatically uh, uh, even in the last uh, few months as a result of the latest attack. It's no, uh, it's no longer considered uh, extremists to talk about uh, Israeli incitements to genocide, for instance, or the maintenance of an apartheid structure of occupation. Those kinds of, that kind of language couldn't be used three, four years ago without completely discrediting the person using 
as I discovered. <laughs> uh, but now it's it's really different. You can you, uh, uh, and one of the things I attempted to do while I was uh, special rapporteur was to use a language appropriate to the reality rather than appropriate to the UN style of discourse, <laughs> and and. Uh, that shouldn't be something that requires uh, uh, a willingness to uh, endure uh, a lot of uh, psychological pushback, but it is. There's a, there's a kind of uh, discipline that requires you not to say how things really are, but to use euphemisms See, occupation is itself a use of euphemism, because it isn't really an occupation, it's an annexation, substantially an annexation. And, and it's a, and it, it, to occup the word, the language of occupation hides the apartheid nature of the way in which the occupation is carried out, even though international humanitarian law uh, imposes a duty on the occupier to protect the civilian population rather than to oppress it. So I think there are, uh, it's important to see this historical flow that favors the struggle of the Palestinian people and to keep that in mind, however difficult the situation on the ground has become. Yes. My name is Abdeen Jabara, uh, Professor Falk. Uh, in terms of this uh, action by Sweden and now the British Parliament and so forth, for a long time the uh, Europeans have uh, kind of taken a hands-off approach to the whole issue about peacemaking and, uh, in the Middle East between the Palestinians and the Israelis. They said that this was the United States uh, bailiwick, and they deferred to the United States. Um, why do you think that change is now taking place? I mean, there's got to be some reason that has to do with either United States power or United States not willingness to um, push the envelope on this. Uh, why do you think that this is occurring now when it didn't occur before? Is it just because of Gaza, or is it because of the... Failure of the Kerry mission, or what? Uh, probably all of the above. Uh, I think it was, it's, there's no single factor that probably uh, explains uh, these developments. But I think it's a, uh, a sense of frustration with the uh, uh, apparent futility of these negoti periodic negotiations uh, where Israel continues to build more and more settlements. And nothing. The, the failure of the Oslo approach is not symmetrical. Uh, Israel gains and the Palestinians lose. The settlements expand, the uh, separation wall was built, the road infrastructure was developed. Uh, and all the while, the Palestinians have told not to object because that obstructs the peace process. Uh, and not to raise issues, everything will be settled in the final status, you know, which is like waiting for the second coming or the <laughs> Messiah to, so to achieve uh, justice. So this is, uh, uh, so I think, also I think probably the decisive factor at least in the, these two cases of Sweden and the United Kingdom, were the uh, shift in public opinion. See, I think public opinion has moved toward a increasing solidarity with the Palestinian Palestinians. Partly the Palestinian victimization, not necessarily the Palestinian liberation, uh, and partly the sense that the U.S. is not acting as a responsible uh, superpower or, or global leader in the way it's handled the, the, its role as supposed intermediary. 
So I think that all of these things are in, uh, part of the explanation. And it's an ambiguous, uh, it's, an, it's an not entirely uh, clear initiative because uh, supposedly the motivation was to help quote-unquote moderate Palestinian forces and to encourage the ne revival of no negotiations seeking a two-state solution. Now in my view, moderate Palestinian forces are the one uh, sure uh, source of continued frustration. They've shown, demonstrated an inability uh, to pursue any kind of effective diplomacy. And the idea of a two-state uh, solution, given 550,000 plus settlers, and given the state of Israeli public opinion, 75% of Israelis in the recent uh, authoritative polls say they're opposed to a, a Palestinian state in 67 borders, they're opposed to uh, IDF withdrawal from the Jordan Valley, and they're opposed to any division of Jerusalem, which is in, in a shorthand or a longhand for saying they're opposed to a two-state solution. So you're saying you, uh, let's get the two-state solution. At the same time, there's no two-state solution. Uh, so it's a, it's a very uh, peculiar message. And many of these initiatives, including those of uh, religious institutions, cling to this two-state mantra even when they favor, for instance, divestment in relation to the settlement, uh, uh, settlement exports. The, it, it, which is an ambiguous message because if you're divesting in order to promote a insoluble solution, what exactly are you doing? It's, it's a, a complicated thing. It makes people feel that, that, that the, if you talk privately to uh, UN uh, diplomats, ambassadors, they'll all tell you there's no chance for negotiated uh, solution along the Oslo lines, but they don't want to say there's no diplomacy that is relevant. So they continue to utter the two-state mantra without having any uh, confidence whatsoever that it's relevant to a solution. What, what do you suggest for um, American citizens civil society um, do. I mean, it, it seems to me that we are responsible, largely, we can say that we're responsible for what's going on there, um, which means that we have, you know, a government that we need to change, which means that uh, we need to talk about this more. But um, um, you know all the difficulties with that, and um, probably more than I do. Um, and I just would be interested to hear what, what, your, what your recommendation to Americans would be um, to, to change this. No, it's an important question. Let me first give an irresponsible answer. Uh, forget Washington. Just forget it. It, it has uh, no, there's no uh, political, uh, significant political resonance that makes it a worthwhile site of struggle. But APAC is part of that. I beg your pardon? But APAC is part of that, so... APAC. Oh, yes, of course, APAC's a, a big part, but it's not the whole part, it's not the whole story. Uh, it's a more complicated, and so is Christian fundamentalism, has been part of the uh, story, too. Uh, but, what, see, I think it's uh, the... the Venues within which one lives are the the, re, the relevant sites of struggle. Whether it's a university such as my own uh, situation, uh, or a, a church group, or a uh, labor organization, 
you know, the fact that there were these demonstrations in uh, Oakland that prevented the unloading of these container ships was symbolically a very important uh, move. And there are very many symbolic things that have moved this uh, legitimacy struggle in a Palestinian direction, including the prayers of, the, of Pope Francis at the uh, separation wall. That was a very uh, uh, iconic moment, I think, and, 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 and it, it, it was a visualization of the injustice and the unendurably long period of oppressive existence where, you know, some years ago I visited a, uh, one of the main refugee camps in Gaza, Khan Yunus, and I met a person who, was, who said he was the fifth generation uh, refugee in the camp, which is, it's hard to imagine living there in these refugee camps for a week, much less thinking that you are born, grow up and die all in the confines and are not allowed out, you know, you're basically, it's a life sentence. It's a life in, in prison. And for us to be, you know, for the United States to claim to be so empathetic with the suffering in Benghazi, which occurred, you know, during the Libyan period and now with Kobani and Syria, those are uh, objectively humanitarian crises. But Gaza is off the charts in relation to the reality and severity of a humanitarian crisis. Um, Jordan Street with the Quake United Nations Office. Um, the Quake United Nations Office. Um, so being at the UN, um, and you touched on it with um, your your, speak, your talks with the diplomats and ambassadors. Um, in the uh, fourth phase, um, the one that you uh, lay out in this book, do you see um, an increased role for the United Nations, or do you see any role whatsoever um, in order to... Um, I couldn't hear the last Do you see any role for the UN um, in order for Palestine to reach self-determination? Uh, I think the, the UN is very important, uh, except uh, as a source of modifying the behavior on the ground, uh, the, uh, uh, which uh, sounds peculiar, but uh, the UN is no better and no worse than the political will of its leading members. And where the political will favors strong action as it did in Libya in 2011, the UN probably is too effective, does too much. But where the geopolitical veto is operative, as it is in relation to Israel-Palestine, uh, and the geopolitical veto is superimposed upon the constitutional veto that exists within the Security Council. It's, in my view, an important uh, additional dimension of the way in which uh, the world system operates at this stage. And that means, uh, as long as that geopolitical veto uh, is exercised, the UN can act symbolically, but it can't act behaviorally. The uh, US can't prevent the formation of a commission of inquiry into the alleged war crimes in uh, Gaza. The Goldstone uh, Commission, you remember, in 2008, was bitterly opposed uh, by U.S. and Israel when it was uh, constituted, and of course when its recommendations came, it was even more uh, vilified. Uh, but it was, and, and it exercised a very important uh, legitimizing role for civil society activism. But it couldn't be, the recommendations couldn't be implemented because of this geopolitical veto. So it's important, in my view, to acknowledge what the UN can do with an awareness 
of what the limits are, and those limits shift with the issue. It can do much more in uh, uh, some settings than in other settings. For instance, if it hadn't abused the mandate in uh, Libya, uh, which was a mandate to uh, establish a no-fly zone, it could probably have been much more effective in Syria than it has been. So there is a, a political process that uh, relates to this issue of effectiveness. But whereas with, in relation to Palestine, this geopolitical dimension is so important, uh, then the UN is not an effective uh, political actor when it comes to behavior. But if, as I'm suggesting, the legitimacy struggle is where the political outcome will probably be shaped in the end. The UN is crucial because it is the most important source of collective legitimacy that exists in the world. Levi Bautista with the United Methodist Church. Thanks, Richard, for your presentation. Noam Chomsky was here last week, and he talked about the BDS movement or the BDS as a form of tactic. And uh, Noam cautioned that a tactic should not hurt the intended uh, recipient of whatever that tactic makes, that it should not further oppress or dehumanize them. Where do you yourself put the BDS movement? Is, would that be one of acts of legitimacy uh, Put differently, my question would be, how do you in fact mobilize, mobilize moral outrage in this instance? No, that's a very important question, and I, I know Noam has had a controversial view of this, <laughs> these texts for a long time. Uh, and actually, he softened the, this view. I mean, he was uh, more, uh, what shall I say, uh, more determinedly uh, opposed to uh, uh, my feeling is, first of all, that this seems to represent what the Palestinians themselves want. Mm -hmm. And I think too often in the history of Palestine, outsiders have tried to decide what's best for Palestine. And that goes for the uh, UN and the League of Nations Ever since the Ottoman Empire, outsiders have been deciding what is best. And I think the whole ethos of anti-colonialism and self-determination is to trust those that speak most authentically for the people who are victimized and are seeking liberation. And of course, that's somewhat ambiguous in this context. The Palestinian Authority, until recently, has been skeptical, if not opposed, to these kinds of tactics. And, um, but as I've tried to argue, I think the real uh, core of Palestinian uh, legitimate activism has shifted from the governmental actors to the civil society actors. And I think they are overwhelmingly supportive of relying on uh, the BDS and other related forms of tactical, uh, 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 tactical uh, initiative. Well, thank you, uh, Richard, for um, writing a book with the word hope in it. <laughs> <laughs> that is it. <laughs> but you, you have come to these problems of global injustice, like Vietnam and Palestine, as, as a leader or the leader of the progressive international law community. 
and I'd like to hear your views on whether law has any role to play in this fifth stage um, that you have foreshadowed by describing the original four. Uh, let me concretize that a little bit by, by saying a, a phrase has occurred to me as a result of what happened in Gaza, and the phrase is the curse of self-defense. Because you talk to relatively so-called liberal people, Jews and non-Jews, at the time of Gaza, and you say, how do you feel about this horror that's occurring there? And the answer is, every country has a right to defend itself. In other words, a total distortion of what international law has to say about what happened in Gaza. Namely, that self-defense, even if justified, which is questionable, uh, is, is subject to very serious restrictions that were not followed. So there's my question about the role of law with self-defense as an example of, of the issue. No, those are uh, actually two difficult, <laughs> two difficult questions uh, uh, connected, of course. Uh, see, the role of law, in my view, is very similar to the role of the UN. And my answer would be similar to the one that I gave to the uh, Quaker gentleman on my right, namely that uh, where the geopolitical veto is operative, law performs symbolically but not behaviorally. And that's uh, supremely true in relation to Israel-Palestine, where uh, the U.S. supported Israel in the exclusion of international law from the negotiating process. I mean, it, it, that was an a, a, uh, unprecedented way of uh, declaring the uh, irrelevance of law to a conflict re re resolving, supposedly conflict resolving process. At the same time, uh, all along, I think, uh, the having international law on the Palestinian side has had the effect of creating a, a, a moral and political consensus in support of their <coughs> rights, the rights of the Palestinian people. And that that consensus is very strong outside uh, the United States. Uh, which is an outlier in this, uh, in relation to this conflict. It's not a t not even in. Re uh, it's different than uh, than Europe, uh, Western Europe, uh, in uh, uh, where th there's a strong Zionist presence in many of the countries, but still the prevailing atmosphere for a long time has been what it is becoming here in the U.S. Finally, at this time. Uh, so, uh, international law does play a very important role in um, underpinning moral outrage and giving people the political uh, self confidence. Uh, to engage in militant forms of nonviolent opposition. And I think that was very important in the anti apartheid campaign uh, against South Africa as well and other uh, issues. The, the self defense uh, uh, issues that you raise are in part given credibility because. The mainstream media and the, uh, our government
and some of the Western European governments and uh, countries like Canada and Australia uh, uncritically examine that kind of uh, misuse of self-defense as a justification for the use of force. Uh, there's a, uh, from a technical point of view, there's a real question as to whether an occupying power can ever claim self-defense in relation to a s occupied territory. And even though Israel claims that after 2005, when the Sharon di uh, disengagement plan was implemented, uh, Gaza is no longer occupied. From the perspective of the international community, it continues to view Gaza as an occupied territory because effective control has been maintained uh, by uh, Israel. And people have uh, sort of analogized the control to a prison in which the guards stay on the, the outer walls and the prisoners are allowed to uh, organize life in the prison. Uh, and I think that is uh, reasonably descriptive. Uh, and, and then if you look carefully at the uh, facts leading up to the uh, use of force in this protective edge uh, recent military operation, uh, they're very uh, unconnected uh, to a credible legal argument that uh, Israel had the right of self-defense, even if you put aside the occupation issues. Uh, the, the ICJ, as you know, uh, examined the American claim of self-defense in relation to Nicaragua back in the 1980s. And uh, actually, uh, you, there was a, a stronger case for self-defense on the part of the U.S. Uh, in that context, and the American judge on the court at that time wrote this extremely long uh, dissenting opinion, uh, objecting to the objecting to the rejection of self-defense by the majority of the court. And so, I think, even aside from the disproportionate use of force, which is also an aspect of customary international law, as you know, uh, there, there isn't a legitimate legal argument uh, that would uh, justify uh, Israel's claim. Now there's, uh, in all these situations, there's also a political and moral argument, and uh, there uh, Israel has a, uh, a certain kind of claim depending on how you view the firing of the rockets uh, and how they, the, uh, the, that dimension of the conflict entered in this uh, recent situation. Where the uh, themes uh, from a close examination of the facts uh, that uh, Israel uh, deliberately provoked uh, Hamas and initiated the uh, uh, air attacks prior to a substantial uh, reliance on rockets uh, by uh, Hamas. And that uh, it was uh, seeking a pretext for launching this kind of offensive that had very little to do, as the last two uh, military operations did, with actually uh, making Israel more secure. Uh, and, and if the real objective was to defeat Hamas as a, or weaken Hamas as a political actor, it also was a, a big failure, an, ir uh, an irrational tactic. Hamas has emerged much more popular even on the West Bank than it had been uh, prior to this military operation. 
and uh, in Gaza it has uh, its popularity increased somewhat, not as dramatically as on the West Bank. So it was a very, uh, the whole discourse on self-defense should have been much more critically examined uh, than it was during the period of attack. Thank you. Uh, Ryan Smith with the Presbyterian Church. Wondering, you've talked uh, some about uh, American intervention and uh, the BDS system. And, and the image that I get in my head is America being the parent giving a hundred dollar allowance and then people stopping to go to the lemonade stand where they make 30 cents. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, does it make sense to include the U.S. in any kind of BDS movement to have a broader impact, to stop the, the blank checks from the U.S.? Um, and, and is that possible in today's geopolitical climate? <laughs> well, two very, yes, I think it certainly makes political sense for the reasons you suggest uh, to, uh, in effect, hold the U U.S. government partially accountable and responsible for what is happening, and that's uh, one important way of doing so. And uh, uh, whether it's politically um, feasible uh, is uh, something that I don't have any strong feelings. It doesn't seem to be feasible at the moment, but moments, uh, things change. And I think there is a changing uh, climate of opinion in the country more broadly. And I think uh, the major religious denominations have an important role to play in creating a momentum in that direction. And finally, even uh, partially deaf congressmen will begin to get the message. Yeah, so my name is Laura Pereira. I represent Peace Organization. It's a member of the Israel Palestine Working Group. And I wanted to ask a follow up question actually to um, several questions that have gone before about the role of the UN and the role of international law. I feel that you know, most of us um, in that group, where many of the representatives are here, we essentially lobby right, the UN. Um, we make statements. Um, we also can comment sometimes on resolutions ahead of time. And I'm wondering what your opinion is on us actually trying to use this opportunity as an opportunity to speak truth, speak truth to power, as it were, because often we're not always concerned about making sure that the legal standards, right, of how to analyze this or Palestine is reflected in all our statements and all of our opinions, because we're very concerned about other messages in our statements being taken up by the powers that be. So, for example, we often talk about people's right to self-defense or um, as a precursor to then asking for greater condemnation of the attacks of Gaza, or on a UN resolution commentary, commentary for example, will let slip um, uh, articles about, or sections about um, terrorism. Whereas actually under the UN laws, um, is, uh, Hamas is not a terrorist organization, right? Um, it's not to say that we condone the use of violence, you can actually um, criticize the use of violence under international law, right? That it must meet international humanitarian law. Uh, principles instead of just going towards terrorism and so on. I'm just wondering basically whether you feel this is a contested space. It's useful for us to try to to basically use our collective voice as people concerned about Israel-Palestine working at the UN to use more standardized legal language in when we make statements. Uh, whether it's worth a while. As you said earlier, it's essentially a, a normative system of moral value. It's not necessarily a given that we'll manage to get what, you know, people to understand or listen to us. But do you find it useful to, to, to use more legal language in this forum? Uh, well, as, uh, you raise an Im important, uh, complex issue uh, about uh, what kind of language is appropriate and effective in uh, different settings. And I, and, uh, what I found was that it was helpful uh, to try to use morally transparent language rather than uh, this sort of formalized discourse that uh, is encouraged in the UN context. <laughs> that, 
and um, I, I had the feeling that, uh, uh, that in the end this was appreciated. Uh, maybe not by the bureau bureaucrats. There's a di distinction you have to make also in the UN context between the civil service and the uh, political actors. And I felt particularly the younger people in these di uh, diplomatic delegations welcomed the departures from this formalized uh, uh, discourse. And even some of their uh, superiors uh, did, though they were somewhat shy about acknowledging it. Uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, depending on the context uh, and the situation, the issue, the mood, the political mood, there's no single answer that covers all the disparate situations and venues and when we use the 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 language of the UN we're embracing a very diverse set of uh, venues and political uh, climates and, and and so I I think one needs to deconstruct that notion of the UN and look at different parts of the UN in terms of their uh, distinctive or uh, specific character. Thank you very, very much.